Proverbs 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. So James here is talking about our selfish desires. Our natural condition is to be selfish. Uh, and that's the source of all our arguing and fighting. It's pride and selfishness. If anybody's arguing about anything, it's because they're being selfish. Uh, because if you were uh, looking out for the good of another person, you would approach them with a humble attitude, uh, not trying to prove them wrong, but trying to assist them or help them. And people, well, people are selfish. A lot of times people reject the kindest gestures, but you can't fight and argue unless there are two people that are trying to get their way, trying to force their opinion or their way on another person. <clears throat> so, if there's a fight and a quarrel, then you need to humble yourself. And if it means the other people will perceive that you lost the fight or argument, then that's fine. You just have to let them think that. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, this is evidence that your motive makes a difference. Because you may ask for, uh, let's just say, money. Ask God to give you money. Um, but God knows why you're asking that and what you want to do with it. And uh, now I've asked for more money <laughs> but maybe I've asked for the wrong reasons or maybe it's uh, just not his will now I, I, I don't really desire to be rich I don't desire that at all I just don't want to have to work two jobs and barely scrape around to make make the bills that's what I desire uh, but maybe I'm not desiring to do good for other people enough with that. Maybe it's only for my selfish desires that I don't have to work two jobs and scrape to pay the bills. But <clears throat> your motive matters. God knows your motive. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And I think what this is really saying is that if you seek to please the world or you seek to pattern your life after the ways of the world, the way that the world views things, uh, as I just mentioned, you know, stepping down from an argument or uh, abstaining from continuing the argument or pushing your opinion, maybe other people would perceive you as losing an argument or being weak. But rather than letting that earthly peer pressure cause you to act in a way that's ungodly, then you walk away and you don't worry about what other people think. Don't give in to the pressures, evil pressures of the world to be selfish and prideful and arrogant. Be humble and let God exalt you when God chooses to exalt you. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? So here again, it says God causes the spirit to dwell in us. I think people do not accept the fact that God is the reason why the spirit dwells in us. God is the source of the spirit. Uh, a lot of times, people, people often say that salvation is a gift of God, but you have to accept it first. You don't have to accept it. God causes the Spirit to dwell in you. There's nothing that you do to allow the Spirit to dwell in you. God causes it to dwell in you. 
And that's what the Bible teaches, but people don't want to believe that. People want to think that they have control over their own life, their own body, their own choices. We are completely have a free human uh, will to choose everything whether we want it or not. And that's just not what the Bible teaches. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So this is a good verse to point out, that Satan does not have power over you. Satan does not cause you to sin. Satan can only tempt you and try you and put stumbling blocks in front of you. He cannot cause you to sin. Now, God can cause you to have the Spirit dwell in you. Uh, God opposes the proud and gives favor to the humble. So we need to submit ourselves. We need to humble ourselves to God's authority and God's sovereignty. And if we resist the devil and his temptations, then the devil will flee from us. The devil has no power over us, and he certainly has no power over God. People like to paint this picture that someday there's going to be this great Armageddon war in heaven where Satan and his angels oppose God and try to overpower God and tear God down. It is completely impossible that Satan can pose any threat to God because Satan cannot even oppose a threat to us. And, and we are weak and frail and sinful. We can resist the devil and the devil will flee from us. He has no power against God or even no power over us. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Now why do you think that God would instruct us to submit, to be humble, uh, to grieve and mourn and wail and change our laughter to mourning and our joy to gloom. Why would he say that? I think it's because if you just imagine a life where everything goes well, where you get everything you want, You've got all the money you want. You've got the nicest house, the nicest cars. You've got all the respect that you can imagine or that you would ask for. If everything goes the way you want it to go, are you ever going to look to God and recognize your dependence on Him? There's no reason. There's no reason for you to recognize dependence on Him if you've got everything you want. So God is deliberately created a system where when we lack the things that we desire, when we don't get everything that we want, we recognize that we are dependent on God. That's when we turn to God. Would you ever pray to God or ask God for anything if you already had everything you wanted? I think the answer is clearly no. You would not even ask God for anything. You wouldn't pray. You wouldn't turn to Him. You wouldn't seek His guidance because everything you wanted, you had. So it's when we humble ourselves, when we don't uh, expect to have the nicest cars, the nicest houses, the, uh, the easiest life, and the most respect, and all these things. It's then that we recognize our dependence on God. It's then that we turn to God. It's then that we recognize our condition of complete hopelessness without God. That we need to recognize our need for a Savior. Recognize our sinful nature. Our evil nature. Uh, and be thankful for His mercy and His grace. And that humble submissive attitude will generate the kinds of 
uh, faith, the kind of faith that we should have, which is an active faith, a faith that responds to what God has done for us and what God asks us to do, which is to love our neighbor. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. And verse 10, I want to skip that. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So we do not have to seek after our own glory. Uh, we need to accept uh, whatever station that God gives us in life. And if we are missing things that we desire or want, then we need to be content with whatever God chooses to give us. And if at any point God wants to lift you up, he can do that. But we need to trust God and let God have control of the situation rather than thinking that we need to control it ourselves. People are way more comfortable if they feel like they are in control of the situation. But God tells us to give up that control, to humble ourselves, and to not seek after our own, our own glory or our own selfish desires, but let God give us whatever he wants to give us in his time. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. So this law that he's talking about, I think, would be the law of liberty or the law that we have in Christ to love our neighbor. Uh, and we should not speak against our brother or sister, because when you do that, uh, you're going against the law of liberty, the law of loving your neighbor. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So we're unqualified to judge our neighbor because we're in the same helpless, lost condition. We are all violators of law. We are all sinners and fall short. Now, I cannot overlook uh, the fact that there is one lawgiver and one judge. That's Jesus. Uh, we can't make up laws, and we can't uh, decide when someone else is guilty or innocent. But this verse 12 also says, And this one, Jesus is able to save and destroy. Now, a lot of people give the destruction credit to Satan instead of Jesus. They say, well, Jesus saves, but Satan destroys. But that's not what the Bible says. It says this one Jesus is able to save and destroy. So whatever the situation whether you are saved or destroyed, it all falls under the authority of Jesus, the one who is able to do it. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. So here it is. We just need to recognize that we're not in control of our life. You have to give up control and recognize that God is the one in control. And if you have any plans for the future, you have to realize that that's only your desire to do these things. But... It may not be the Lord's will, and if it's not the Lord's will, it will not happen. If you plan to go on vacation next year to England, um, that is only your desire and your plan. You have absolutely no control over whether that will happen or not. Um, all sorts of things could happen to change your mind or to change your even ability. You could be dead. Uh, you could have fallen on... Hard times. Maybe your house burned. Uh, you never know. All sorts of things can happen that will completely change your plans for the future. And a Christian should always recognize 
their dependence on God for everything. And uh, and accept His will in our life. We should desire His will. And His will may not be that we take a vacation to England or Disney World or whatever. And we need to be fine with that. Instead of getting mad at God for messing up our plans, we should praise God for Him carrying out His will in our lives, even if it's not what we desire. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. This last verse uh, almost seems like a unrelated point. You know, James is full of uh, tidbits of wisdom that are not necessarily tied to one another. Uh, but he's talking about submitting your life to God's will and you know, and how you view the future, uh, whether you think you're in control or God's in control. And then he just throws in here at the end, if anyone knows to do good and doesn't do it, it is a sin. I don't know if that's tied to the section before it or not but it's certainly uh, just a general truth I can understand that that if you know to do good but don't do it then that's a sin oh. so that's James chapter 4